Thank you for joining me for a Sunday School lesson today. Our lesson is going to come from the Gospel according to Luke, verses 41 through 53. And we're going to talk about the willingness of Jesus to suffer and to die for us. Now, if you were with me last week on our Sunday School lesson, we talked about the Lord's Supper and the meaning of the Lord's Supper for us as a reminder of what Jesus did. Now, we're going to pick up on that same thing, and we're going to watch as he carries along. I, I mentioned to you last week that Jesus' hour, that the hour had come for Jesus to die on the cross, to be placed in the borrowed tomb, and to be alive again after three days. The hour has come. And so he's trying to get these disciples ready for it. Now, I'm sure that they absolutely could not yet comprehend two things. One, they could not comprehend the agony of his death, and they could not comprehend the joy of his resurrection. This was a whole new thought process for them. And the truth of the matter is, it's a whole new thought process for us. I, I don't know why. I don't know why God loved me so much that he gave his son to die in my place. Now, I'm glad he did, but I don't know why other than he's God. He made me and he loves me. And in that result... I come to rejoice in the fact of Jesus and his willingness. Now, you remember, he's going to ask God to let him off the hook if there's any way for it to come to pass. He wants that to happen. And life can be so hard. Even the life that we live in this day and time, it can just get difficult. Health problems that you have to deal with. We knew so little about health problems for so many years of our marriage. So little, so little about health problems. And Nancy's mother had health problems probably from the time she was born. My mother had health problems from the time she was born. So health problems makes life hard to live. Jobs. If you're unhappy in a job, it makes life hard for you. If you're working for people who simply are non-appreciative of what you're doing, that makes the job hard for you. Finances, that makes it hard for you. If we're not careful, we'll find ourselves battling an uphill battle in finances. So life can get hard, dealing with family and family relations can get hard. Now, thank God I have not had to deal with that. But I have been with families. I have watched grown men, die, uh, grown men anguish over their children. Anguish. I remember one man in one of my churches. I am convinced he had had an examination. The doctor told him, his heart was good. Everything was right. He went down to see his daughter, and she treated him so cruelly. She treated him so badly. He came home, came to my office. His house was right across the street from my office. He came to my office, and he wept like a little boy about his daughter and how she had treated him. Within the month, if not the days. I don't remember the exact chronology. He was dead. I'm convinced. And I told his wife. And I told his daughter that he died of a broken heart. People ask me, how did he die? He died of a broken heart. I'm convinced of that. Only one child, and to be treated by that one child. And then, oh well, I'll get off of that. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes family relations can be bad. 
We need to keep them as good as we can, as sweet as we can. So Jesus comes to express his confidence in God. And he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's pick up Acts chapter 22, beginning with verse 41. Acts chapter 22, beginning with verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. Now, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. About a stone's cast. Now, a stone's cast is this, as best I understood the resources I consulted. A stone's cast is how much, how far the distance is that you can pick up a stone and cast it to try to kill somebody. You know the capital punishment of the Jews was stoning. It was not crucifixion. That's for the Romans. They got it from the Carthaginians. And so here are the stones that you pick up and you cast. I don't know how far that is, depending on how big you are, how strong you are. But it was about a stone's cast, the scripture says. Went into the Mount of Olives, verse 41. About a stone's cast, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, underscore willing, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, was come to the disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep you? Why are you sleeping? Rise up and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Now here's Jesus on the last lap of his life. And he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He had been there so many times. And this is the place where he retreated with his disciples. And these words of Luke remind us that Jesus goes to the Garden with one specific thing in mind. Is there any way I can bypass the cross? Now, please understand, he's simply asking God, is there another way that we can do this thing of redemption? Are you willing to take this cup? Now, the cup of wrath is used over and over in the Old Testament. It's a common phrase. For instance, Psalm 60, verse 3, Psalm 75, verse 8, Isaiah 29, 9, 51, 17 through 23, Jeremiah 25. Just some of the places in Scripture where it talks about the cup of wrath. So is there any way to deliver me from this cup of wrath? Now that's a legitimate thing. He's not saying, God, I don't want, I don't want to make atonement for the sins of the people, but is there any way I can do it outside of the cross? Now, remember, Jesus has said all along, and if I be lifted up, he said this to Nicodemus, I will draw all men unto me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now, he's building that on the concept as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus knew he had to be lifted up to draw all men unto him. It could not be death by stoning or by any other method. It must be by crucifixion. So he comes and great drops of blood, great drops of blood issue from him. And when he gets up from prayer, he comes to the disciples and finds them. Why do you sleep? Rise up. 
Now, the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane is tied in also with the Kidron Valley. As I understand my topography of the city of Jerusalem, here's the altar, and the blood sacrifice is poured on the altar, and that blood sacrifice runs down through the Kidron Valley. So as Jesus goes down through the Kidron Valley, it's just the natural thing that he's going to see, the blood sacrifice. And it's the natural thing that he's going to be reminded. So when he comes to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, all of this is in the background. And you can imagine how much blood it would be if they 230,000 or more lambs slaughtered. Plus there were some bulls and all of the animals that were used in the Passover feast. So he would naturally have this question. It's a natural question. It's a question that all of us ask. Is it possible that we can get around this? And then Jesus makes the statement that I've used so many times in my own life and with others, not my will, but thine be done. You see, once we come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of our life, it's no longer me and mine. It's His. I am His. And I must understand that. I don't bypass the will of God. Now, sometimes I miss it, but I don't bypass it. I think God's will happens in perspective stages. I think there is the permissive will of God. I don't understand the perfect will of God, and so I go on doing what I know to do and how I know to do it and believe that to be the will of God in my life, and God permits it to happen year after year, year after year. And then suddenly there comes a reality. I need the perfect will of God for my life, not just the permissible will of God for my life. And God let me, lets me see that perfect will, how I should handle it, what I should do about it, and then I have to have the courage to do it. And so Jesus is praying. He starts out by saying, if you're willing, and then he ends up by saying, but not my will, but thine be done. He wants more than anything else in life to do the will of God. That should be the testimony of every believer. I want more than anything else in life to do the will of God. And that will of God that comes to my life may not parallel anything in your life. It may be totally different than anything God wants you to do. But now don't try to tell me that there are some things you are doing that you consider to be the will of God in your life. Like one pastor one time gave up his wife and his children to marry his secretary and then had the audacity to tell me, this is the will of God for my life. That is baloney theology. It is not the will of God. It is not the will of God to give up your family. It is not the will of God. Now, I know divorce happens. It's the death of a, it's the burial of a dead marriage. I understand that. But I'm telling you, it is not God's will that I leave my family and my children and take up with someone else. She had to divorce her husband, her family. I simply cannot believe something like that is the will of God. Or I find people who are absolutely unconscionable in their relationship to just about everybody around them. They can't get along with anyone. And you try to reason with them, and this is the will of God because this is how he made me. Listen, God never made a Christian to be angry all the time. God never made a Christian to be brutal to his wife and kids. God does not do that. God's will is that we love one another. And surely if we can love God, we can love one another. If we can love God whom we have not seen, we surely ought to be able to love those we can see. 
Now, they may frustrate us and all that goes into making up parenting, all that goes into making marriage, all that goes into all of the process. I'm not here to discuss marriage today. I'm simply telling you that in the process, there are some things right and there are some things wrong, but we should always seek to do the will of God before anything else. And then there appeared an angel to help him. Isn't it interesting that no one was left on earth that could help Jesus in this situation? Now, he had helped many people in desperate situations. He had made the blind to see, the lame to walk. He had cast out the demons. He had raised people from the dead. At least three we know about. He raised them from the dead. They came back to life again. The classic example, of course, is in the 11th chapter of John's Gospel, the raising of Lazarus. That was the moment they decided we're not going to try to get along with Jesus any longer. We're going to find a way to kill him. We're going to find a way to put him to death. And so all of this, all of this with the understanding, I want to do the will of God, I want to be, and the angel comes to strengthen him, a divine gift from God. Now, the same thing happened, if you'll remember, especially as Matthew records, the temptation of Jesus by Satan. He, when it was all over, he had not eaten for 40 days, 40 nights, and an angel came and ministered to him at the end of that. And here's the angel coming to minister to him through this agony of Gethsemane. And then when he gets up, uh, having these great drops of blood. Now, I don't know how to explain the drops of blood. Uh, Some say that the strain on him was so great that the capillaries broke and, and it was blood running down his face and dropping off. I don't, I don't know about the great drops of blood. All I know is the agony could cause anything to happen to the human body that it caused to happen to Jesus. And so he goes then and says to his disciples, Why are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping? Why aren't you praying? Lest you enter into temptation. One of my favorite places in all the Bible is Philippians chapter 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any compassion and all that goes into that. But the part I want you to hear, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, here it is, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, the angel, things in earth, the disciples, things beneath the earth, those demonic elements, Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that's what Jesus wants to happen. And he wants not only it to happen to him, he wants it to happen to his disciples as well. So here is Jesus sweating drops of blood so that he will not enter into temptation, but do the will of God. 
And here are the disciples. And if you read the John account of this, three times this happens. Jesus comes back the third time. They're still sleeping. And the noise begins and they begin to hear the rumble. And it begins to be obvious that they're coming after Jesus. Three times. They were sleeping and they will enter into temptation. And we'll see that especially in the case of Simon Peter when he denies the Lord three times because he went to sleep in the garden. Now we'll get to that. But here he is trying to get the disciples to understand what they are doing and what they need to do. This divine grace of the angel is an intriguing thing for me. And the parable of the unjust steward. When Jesus prays, he prays with such intensity. It was interesting, one of the commentaries said, it's the same concept of the unjust steward when he was finally caught. And his master said to him, you're without anything. He said, please don't make me do that. I am too weak to dig. That idea of digging, I, I just don't have anything else to go on. Jesus had totally exhausted everything about himself for this moment that his hour had come. So here's the angel. He won the battle over temptation on his knees and he knew that he was going to go to the cross and they missed it because they went to sleep. He was emotionally drained. Now, when we come to talk about Jesus and all that is involved, one of the great misunderstanding uh, that's not exactly the right word to use one of the great mysteries of the death of Jesus is the betrayal by Judas Iscariot let's read about that in verse 47 through 50 chapter 22 47 through 50 and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And when they were, and they which were about him saw what would follow. And they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite? with the sword. One of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now, when we read again John's Gospel, he tells us the servant's name was Malchus and the one who swung the sword was Simon Peter. Now, I try to get the picture of this. John says there was a multitude a band of men. Now, a band of men usually meant a cohort of the Roman army. Now, every source I went to talked about this cohort. It could be anywhere from 200 soldiers to 1,000 soldiers. Now, let's take the low number. Let's just say there were 200 soldiers plus all the religious leaders plus those curiosity people who when you see a crowd, you just get involved in it. And they come and there's one man they're looking for. So it is one against 200 plus. Well, the disciples are there, okay? Add to them 12 more, or add to them 100 more. And the overwhelming odds. Now, just imagine if it were a thousand in the cohort that came. 
when they came, they had one thing in mind, to find Jesus. And Judas comes, and Judas betrays him with a kiss. Now, the mystery of it all is, Judas had been with Jesus all three and a half years of his earthly ministry. He knew what Jesus had done. He had been the treasurer. And John points out he was a thief. He was robbing from the treasury, apparently. And here's Judas who betrays him with a kiss. And he does it for a paltry 30 pieces of silver. He betrays Jesus, but with a kiss. The kiss usually was on both cheeks and meant, you are my friend and I love you. And Judas used this. That's why Jesus said, you're going to betray me with a kiss. You're betraying yourself as well. Well, Jesus was willing to go through all of this for us. Now we're going to see when he dies, we're going to get into the death, understand the sacrifice as much as we can. But I just want you to know, Jesus willingly went to Calvary for us. By the way, Calvary is the Latin. Golgotha is the Hebrew. He died for us. Well, thank you for being with me for the Sunday School lesson today. I hope you have learned something that you can apply to your own life. Just remember, Jesus is Lord of life. God bless you.